Hi, my name is Treya Jackson, and I am going to continue my conversation about foster care. And, um, and we are going to move towards um, an action plan. This is our call for action, and I think this is a very good way to put it out there so that how can people help? How can the public help? How can the media help? How can politicians help? Directors of different DCFS programs across the country who are struggling, and we're struggling with a lot of same issues. We're struggling with where to put these kids. Where do we put children when, when we don't have anywhere maybe to put them? We don't have enough homes. Um, certain funding cuts sometimes have happened. Um, also, um, beds were taken away by a certain administration in the state of Illinois placed by um, homes, foster homes, and that just didn't happen. So we've had a lot of changes um, in our state, state of Illinois, and, um, and of course in my last podcast we did talk about some things taking place in Illinois that's not a good thing, you know, it's kind of a bittersweet thing, and, um, and I wanted accountability taken, I did want some accountability taken. But I wasn't happy to hear that our director was put into contempt three times. Um, that just doesn't reflect well you know, on our state, and and it does um, it does make us look like, like what are we doing over there? What are we doing over there? You know, Springfield and stuff. So so um, even though I want accountability to be taken, I also want to be fair too. I want to be fair to the person this job and it's a hard job you know, I would not want to be directed to this I, um, I want to contribute to the process I want to be a team player and I don't know if I would want the big job of saying I'm director and I wouldn't want it for the title or the prestige but I would like to like I said um, talk with that director and see what his thoughts and thinking process is of where we should go because I think everyone needs to come together and we need to talk about this issue and we have different levels of understanding of the foster care system there's some people who will be educators such as myself and I can tell you my stories I can share other kids stories and we can um, use that to promote change to promote understanding and then we also have people who are the protectors. That is the state, the state and uh, DCFS and different entities of the um, social services, the protection agencies that um, actually and take away the kids and they're going to protect the kids. And we know that they are not always doing such a good job as from my experiences. So then we have the protectors. Another protector is a caseworker. You know, so it's the biggest ally of a child in foster care. And then we also have the foster parents. Foster parents are supposed to be, you know, the people who are going to be there and guide these children and love them. And um, until maybe they can go home, maybe their parents will um, be able to pull their situation together and get the help they need. So we have a lot of people involved here. Also have sex. We have doctors and psychiatrists and all those good people, and we have case reviews and the personnel at you know DCFS and all the social services agencies that um, monitor like supervise visitations and stuff like that. So, with that being said, I would like to introduce that I wrote what I hope to be built. It's called the Foster Child Awareness Initiative. And it really is just, it's really primarily talking about the takeaway process. It takes you through the stages of being a foster child, you know, the so-called welcome process, you know, and um, the foster home, the pre-placement, what do all those things mean? And I think that everyone needs to be educated on what these things mean. And, and also, what kind of bills are out there? Ready, what policies are in place, and I want this policy to really be like almost like um, 
a little bit more than the, the foster child bill of rights. I wanted it to be where we are not denied rights that other children have. And in my time, as well as in other kids' time, even now, kids are moving around like crazy. They're moving around and they're missing a lot of school, they miss friendships. How does the foster care system and your experience with it actually factor into the person you become as you age out? And there's a lot of struggles. And I truly believe if we can figure out this problem with the foster care system and how to keep more families together if we can, not to have so many kids in the foster care system for one, but to have it there because unfortunately we're going to need it because there's going to be some kids that are just going to be abandoned. They're going to be abused. They're going to be in such a bad situation that they need this. And for the kids who have died in the hands of their parents, these kids should have been there. And I can't guarantee that nothing happens to kids in foster care. It's like I've given you a lot of examples where things do happen. But at least they maybe would have had a chance. And maybe they would have gone to a good foster home. They would have healed. They were young enough to heal. You know, especially little, especially little AJ. You know, he was at that age where he could have found a good home. And he could have been um, taken care of. And it didn't have to end so tragically. Um, all these stories, they just break my heart. So, so I want everyone to know that this is a very personal subject for me. It's a very personal subject. And also with maturity, um, I have uh, decided that we should, um, that I should write this, um, this bill. And I was already told that a lot of this stuff is already in policy, but it's not being maybe enforced. And maybe we do need to change a little bit, you know, tweak it a little bit. But I really would like even if it's not passed, I would love for everyone just to read it so that they know that someone out there, especially foster kids, you know someone's in their corner. And we know that, hey, this should be not. And we should be put in a safe environment when we're taken away. And um, I want to say that I know it wasn't planned. This was a plan to take us away and hurt us more. And I really want to believe that. Means that there's not some background you know, kind of like incentive for them. But they really, really have their heart in the right place. And I really do have faith in a system that can help children. And I want everyone just to, you know, if I put the bill online, maybe everyone can read it. And um, I'm hoping to hear first from the representative that this could be maybe. Um, signed and um, it can be um, adjusted into law and I, I would like that I like that very much and I don't even want my name on it I, I just want it to be the foster the foster child initiative and awareness uh, that's all I want I, I want it to be used as a tool to educate so that everyone has that opportunity to see um, that there is changes in process you know so like I said, I, I did all of this on a personal basis, and I, I wanted to write all six of my books. And I wrote all six of the books, and I came out with, um, the first book was published, and it was quite a process. There was a lot of emotion going on, you know, when I, brought, you know, when I actually published a book. There's a lot of stuff going in foster care, too, as I published a book. There was also a lot of um, a lot of changes that I started to see with the foster care system and stories I was hearing. So I then decided to write this bill so that I, it kind of goes aside um, with the actual book. So it's like, here's my story. Here's a bill. Maybe it could be passed. If not, just read it and give it consideration. And that's too look at it and read it. Um, some people a little higher power than myself. <laughs> and then um, I, I I wanted to come up with um, a way to bring that awareness out to the public. And part of that was is that it was a call for action. It's, it's, it's
it's a foster child movement. I was going to name it the foster child movement. Then I thought, well, maybe we should do a foster child movement because some kids don't make it into foster care, but they're important too. All the kids who lost in the hands of their parents and their lives were taken. Why don't we call it the children's movement? So that's when I decided to call this very important movement the children's movement. And we've seen a lot of movements. There's been a lot of children's issues. And so I decided to call it that. And I'm like, okay, so how do I promote this? How do I put it out there that this is what I want? You know, I want people to understand. I don't want people to go, oh, it's just a bunch of formal foster kids complaining. And uh, now they're not foster kids, so who cares? Well, it does matter. It trickles into everyone's life, foster care. I'm sure everyone probably around has known that foster kid the kid that doesn't talk or that abused kid who always made excuses for the bruises all over. And we know that kid, right? You know? So I wanted to make everyone aware of the issue. And there's people who know about foster kids. You know, we know about the numbers. We know about the statistics. We, we know about the negative statistics and we know a little bit about the positive ones. So, I wanted to do this, and I put a lot of time and effort into it. Sometimes I was up at work all day, and um, I have a very important job. I get to help people every day, and that's like my favorite aspect of my job, is I get to do something, and it's very meaningful. And during the pandemic, you know, I started working from actually home, and um, that was a little bit challenging at first, because I, you know, I have a little one, I used to run around, I used to say hi to everyone. So I, I I find joy in helping people and giving back to people. And I have a lot of experience with things I went through, so it does help out, you know, when you know you are that people person. And sometimes people just want to talk to you. And you know, you're not there to be a therapist, but sometimes they just need that extra moment and care, you know? So as I stayed home and I would go and read this movement in the book until 2 in the morning sometimes. I'd get back up, do it all again. Of course, it was exhausting, you know, but I knew that it would be great. It was done. So, a call for action is also about um, our politicians, right? You know, we have a problem. We think they always say, talk to your representative, talk to your representative. And I talked to my representative. I did, and he seemed like he was listening, he was hearing things, he told me about the foster kids not being moved around the garbage bags anymore. And I had kind of mixed feelings and bittersweet feelings about that, you know. I had thought, hmm, it shouldn't take taken this long to come up with a bill like this, right, a policy. And I was happy that it was done. I was appreciative, but really, it shouldn't have taken that long. So... I have a lot of mixed feelings about bills that took so long to get passed. I don't like that. I feel that we were not put at the top of the list and we were often brushed aside and that our lives did not matter. And that's how a lot of foster kids feel. They still feel that way, is that we're being brushed aside. And we were silenced. We were silenced and we were threatened. And we were told that nobody would listen to us. So I, I have a problem with that. So I feel that we cannot be silenced anymore. Um, we can't. With all the books coming out about foster kids and foster care experiences and everything, we cannot sit here and really pretend like this didn't happen. We can't all be lying, right? We can't all be exaggerating stories and stuff like that our stories are so similar and they're popping up all over states so it's not like my best friend down the street wrote a book you know when I told people I was going to write a book they said yeah right and I said no I'm going to write a book I'm going to write a book I'm going to do it and a lot of people just didn't take me seriously so now I have written all the books and I plan to drop them at the appropriate time so 
I would like to see happen is that we all can come together. And I would like politicians to come together. I would like the politicians to listen to us, to us formal foster kids. I want us to listen. I want them to listen to the current foster kids. And considering now the law was passed that foster kids, current foster kids can actually talk to the media, I think it's a good thing. I think that all of us have to share our stories, both good and bad. And I really, really stress that politicians have to listen. They have to listen. They have to sit down with us. We are helping. We put them in office, and they serve us. They are public servants, and I want them to know that we, we all can help. We can have rallies, demonstrations, and peaceful demonstrations. That's gonna harm people or harm people's property. But we we should have our voice. We should have our moment to get up there on a stage and say, "Hey, this is our story." We should own our story. We should not have to sugarcoat it or make it sound better or not um, tell certain nasty details or leave out the good details about it. So I want us all to come together. And I also want, you know, the local people, you know, like schools and, you know, churches and places where, where kids can feel safe to also um, contribute to the foster kids and educate people. What is foster care? What is abuse? What is that? When you see a child in need, when you see a family in need. And I really, really want everyone to just love each other more, care for one another more, and really understand what we're trying to do here. And I will tell you that I am not here a troublemaker, and I'm not here to um, cause issues. I want to bring about a movement so that we can make things better. I, I'm not a troublemaker. I'm not out here to um, cause trouble. I'm not trying to um, destroy anything. I'm trying to educate people, and I would like the system to actually come to its knees so that we can reform it. I want everyone to be able to tell the truth. Even when they don't have control of the system, it's okay to say that I don't know what to do and I need help. And I think that within um, the foster care system, sometimes people are scared to ask for help. And we haven't got it right yet. So I'm gonna give them a life of what should happen we can just make it better and my ideals may not work but nothing else has worked so far so I think that the public you know and we um, talking about you know that our our representatives were asking for a special session to be to bring in um, talks about DCFS they need to include the public in that they need to you need to bring together the right people. Okay, you can't bring in a group of people from all the same level and expect them to give an open-minded, um, unsubjective kind of overview of the problem. We have to bring in people from all walks of life, all different educational levels, all different cultures, races, religions. And so we can talk about it on every single level. And that's what I ask for and that's what I really want to see happen and it should happen it should happen to where we all can sit down stand up and we can you know share happy moments and cry together about what we didn't do what we should have done and but I really want us to go forward and not backwards because sometimes when bad things happen you have people who want to go investigate what happened how it happened when it happened and we don't seem to move forward very much. So let's move forward. Let's fix the problems. Then we can go back and say what we did wrong, okay? You know, 
it's not really where you start, it's where you finish. And even though I was hurt by this system, I am willing to be part of change. And I don't hold grudges against people. I'm not going to sit here and hold a grudge against the state or against my case or what they did. Even against the foster parents. You know, some foster parents have wronged me really bad, but I'm not going to carry around that and harvest that kind of negative feelings. It doesn't do me any good to do that. It doesn't. And I, I did hold them inside for a long time. But I learned how to let them go. Let them go. I'm not going to let them affect me. Because when you hold grudges and stuff like that, and you harvest these feelings and they're negative, they still have control over you. And I'm not going to let them have that control over me. But I am not going to back down. I am going to say what needs to be said. And I'm not going to try to hurt anybody's feelings intentionally. But I know that people out there are going to be offended. They're going to be offended and they're going to be like, I wasn't like that person. Good foster parent. I'm offended that you're saying this, and I do not mean to do that. But I want everyone just to have an understanding and not to just judge me because she's a troublemaker, she's upset, she's coming back at the system. I have only good thoughts and positive thoughts in there to do this. I want to tell everyone about the work I've been doing and how we can actually And we really need to bring that kindness out. We need to help these children. And we need to also help the families that are involved. So it's not just a child when they're taken away that's, you know, having the issue. Okay, that's going to have issues. So you got the parents there. Um, they There's an array of issues that come into play when kids are taken away. And we have to examine all of them. Like poverty... The housing, where do they live, the violence in the neighborhood. We have to also look at, you know, mental health, you know, mental illness. We have to look at um, uh, employment, access to, like, services. Like, do they have access to services for counseling, for family counseling, when there is a problem, like, with substance abuse in the household? Do they have somewhere to go? Is there someone going to help them? And that's what we need. That's what all these people need to have access to this. And if they don't have access to it, then it could be a significant issue. And we also have to look at the race factor and discrimination. And also different social values. And how, what are the standards between um, certain races? You know, what are the vows there? You know, where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Because some people have an aspect that a kid needs this, this, this. But in reality, they may only have a bad dresser. But some people might feel that they need more. And depending on how you were raised and everything, maybe those things are important. And sometimes that goes into um, goes into race and social economic status. It goes into a lot of different um, different areas. Um, you have to understand that some people didn't grow up with anything you had. Like when I came into foster care and I went to a foster home, they gave me all kinds of stuff. I'm like, whoa, I am so spoiled. But in reality, I was being given things that all the other kids had. I never had it, so I was thinking, wow, I'm living really in high class here. But, but there's a lot of kids who have the opposite. They go to a foster home where they don't get much at all. And so, is that okay? It depends. There are certain parenting standards that you know, the state has. And foster parents have to um, actually go by this too. They actually have to abide by this. So, so that's what I want to um, get out there. Is that there's a lot of issues that go on. And um, we have to look at all these things going on especially poverty and uh, poverty is a big one poverty is probably one of the biggest factor and it kind of goes into neglect when they start to say you're neglecting your child 
you know, how am I neglecting my kid? You know, I have two jobs. And so you have to look at the aspect of what neglect is and um, the poverty issue. Because sometimes you can be poor, but it doesn't mean you're neglecting your child. But there are certain standards that the state has concerning neglect. So I, I, I really would like to um, use my knowledge as power here and to explain how these things actually um, can lay out a movement so we can bring awareness, so we can educate, so we can help the kids heal and give the kids the opportunity to express their feelings. Because there's a lot of kids who are in foster care who don't get to express themselves. They keep everything bottled up because we're scared. And I'm going to tell you um, ways in which everyone can help a child. So I hope everyone is getting a point to move into action. We need to help. We need to do um, rallies. We need to do demonstrations. We need to help the government understand. And we have to force them to see sometimes what they don't always see from our point of view. They see it from their point of view. But I wanted them to see it from our point of view. I want kids to speak out. I want kids who are in care to be able to speak out and give their own opinion about what it is like to be in foster care how scary it is and it's okay to be scared it's okay to go to homes and say I'm scared without the fear of retaliation and I mean there are kids and like myself and I was a foster kid I was scared to sound sad if I cried too much I was told if I cried you better be careful they're gonna put you in a sick ward they're gonna put you on medicine you're gonna be a zombie and they weren't lying Foster kids are one of the groups that were so oppressed by being locked up in a psych ward that we were actually referred to as Prozac Nation because like almost the majority of the kids who were foster kids around us, they fall on Prozac. And it's really sad that we were on Prozac. We, we were subjected to testing, psychological testing that was unfair. We were scared is our true feelings. So we couldn't get the help we needed because if we cried or we said we're sad, they would turn that into a depression. And were we really depressed, they would convince us that we had some serious underlying mental issue we needed to get help for. There were a lot of kids in the foster care system that were damaged from medications. And they had permanent damage and dependency that actually led to worse dependency and to higher level drugs. And these drugs sometimes led to their deaths because they committed suicide. There's a lot of kids in the system that have either attempted suicide or have carried through the plan. I, I actually would admit that I, I wanted to, I, I just wanted to not be here. I didn't want to be here because of all this stuff going on. But suicide risk, you know, a lot of kids have come and told their foster parents or their staff members at the group homes that, you know, hey, I feel really depressed. And they were told to go to their rooms. I was told to go to my room. And there's been some suicides by foster kids. And they just lose because nobody would give them the time of day. And these have happened. These incidences have happened. And these incidences haven't always been captured by the media. You know, I think there was one that was at, that was at a, um, Gumpus Maryville, I think, a Maryville Academy, I think we called it back then, um, and a little girl had um, committed suicide. She was depressed. And um, if you go through what we went through, you'd be depressed too, okay? And things that were going on in our lives constantly changing. How can you even grasp that? You know, there's people who move one time in their lifetime. You know, you were a kid, you were like 10, and that's how Think about being a new kid 10 times a year. Think about you know, kids not liking you and being going to places, constantly moving. Think about how that is. So this is a wake-up call. This is a wake-up call for them. That foster care is no joke. It is like incarceration at times of a rescue that you want to have that doesn't when you want it to happen. And then there are some kids who only imagine kids at a time that went to homes and they stayed.
stayed in their homes. They stayed in their foster homes. And they were there for like 10 years, and then they aged out, and everything was wonderful. But then the problems came when they aged out. They did not um, do well with the aging out process. They had these underlying problems that they really needed to get therapy for. But they were led to believe that they were okay, that they were doing well. They stayed in one home. What's the problem? Well, sometimes child abuse can manifest itself. Neglect can, sexual abuse, all the abuses and neglect. Abandonment issues. I, I had abandonment issues because um, I didn't have that connection with anybody. So I was really scared to get close to people at first. And then when I did get close to them, I was always worried that they would just leave me. Now, a lot of kids have a lot of issues like this. And post-traumatic stress disorder doesn't get, like, it can get better, but you never get rid of it fully. And I never did. And I never realized that it was bad until I got older. And then I started to realize that I had a lot of issues. And I, I didn't know how to have friends. I didn't know how to even make friends. And I didn't know how to have conversations with them. And I was really young at heart. I was young for my age. So I, I ended up having trouble connecting with people my own age and who were older. I, I didn't have that connection there. And it's amazing when people find out that you were a foster kid. So they don't know you're a foster kid. And then you find out and they go, oh, that explains it all. And I'm like, that explains what? And he said, well, how you're withdrawn. Well, you can be withdrawn for lots of reasons. But as soon as you tell them you're a foster kid, then everything that you do makes sense. And that's just a way to put you in a box. And that just makes no sense. It really doesn't make any sense to say that to somebody. Just because you were announced that you're a foster kid or you, know, you were incarcerated or something like that, that does not tell everyone the person you are and what you're talking It really doesn't. figured you out because you were a foster kid. And it's used as a way to discriminate you. Oh, those kids. Oh, so you do that. So what did you do to get in the system? There's a lot of misconceptions about what land kids in the foster care system, who we are, how we relate to people. And just because we have a problem, it should never always be blamed on the part that we are a foster kid. You can have issues not being a foster kid. You can have issues being a foster kid. And the kids in foster care have a lot, a lot of different issues. And I don't think that many of the kids have like the exact same issue you did. And so I want, I just want to have people understand that we have to understand what's going on in the system. We have to understand these kids. You have to really think about it. I think about how would you feel if you were a foster kid? And I want the people who are making the laws, you know, the representatives and the government, and on every level, especially the state and federal level, to understand the emergency that we have with this problem. And if we can figure this out, we can figure out a lot of problems because a lot of kids who are foster kids, who were foster kids, are in the state systems. They're in the prison system. They are having problems raising their kids. They are the ones who we have to sit and we have to say, okay, let's fix this problem so that nobody else has to suffer and so we can get the numbers down. And this is our way that we can actually do that. So how do we promote healthy foster care? How do we bring in um, more foster parents, more good foster parents, and um, get people to want to contribute to foster care? One way we do that is we make it as a contribution to society that foster parents um, want to parent. I've talked to a lot of different foster 
foster parents. And it's just some really good foster parents. I know that uh, foster parents that I recently talked to adopt that they decided to become foster parents and then have kids that are eligible for adoption to be placed with them so that they can adopt and they didn't care if the kids by like what race they are or anything like that they just wanted children and I said and I think that's the greatest thing of all is when parents just want to be parents and I think those kind of parents um, will make good parents because they're not being so specific with, I don't want this kid with this problem or that problem or this race or that race. And I guess every foster parent can have their preference to what they want. So, um, so also the red tape. If we can make things easier for foster parents to um, possibly adopt or just be foster parents. And also when a child says they don't want a visitation and that the kid should be able to make that decision at a certain age. If you're 10 years old, you're saying, hey, I'm going to visit with my dad because he sexually abused me. He physically abused me. And that should be good enough. That should be good enough. And the children should not be forced to visit. They really shouldn't. It's nice parents, foster parents, are caught in the red tape act because they try to rely on that to the caseworker. And the caseworker takes that to the judge. And then the judge says, well, they have to do that foster parents are interfering in the child's visitation. And I can understand why the judge and why other people, officials of the child care system would think that. Because there have been foster parents that did do that. You know, they didn't want them visiting. Um, they didn't want to cooperate with the visitation of the parents. And there's some times where there shouldn't be visitation. There just shouldn't be. And there's some times where there should be visitation. And if a child wants to cut off visitation, I say go for it. I say go for it because there has to be a point where if you're having a nightmare every time you see this person, take it from my point of view. I was a kid. I was forced visitation. I went through a lot of show issues this game with this person that is subjected me to this. Why would I want to be reminded of that every day? While I'm trying to heal, I get to see the person who caused it. get a kid put in your care it's like you know the good foster parents they don't want to lose that child and I was taken away from some good foster parents and they were in tears they were crying because I was being ripped away and um, they really wanted to keep me and they knew what would happen to me in the foster care system and they were right I would linger and I did I lingered in a foster care system and it was not fair what happened. Race should not be a factor when a child's being um, possibly up for adoption, nor should we um, look at the, you know, the parents if they're same sex. I, I don't think that there is anything wrong with that. And I don't see anything um, that could go wrong just like with um, a mother and a father. Two fathers, two mothers, who cares? We are being too specific about what finds a family, and maybe you should let the kids define the family. Let the kids define it. I mean, if you have a 10-year-old and he says, hey, I want to be adopted by these two men, they're taking care of me, who cares? There is no way that you can convince me that the child says it's okay, that the government should have policies that actually say they can't. So that's why I'm glad that that the state of Illinois does recognize that, and they um, are working towards allowing, um, not working towards, they actually do allow same-sex couples to become foster parents, and that's what caused conflict before. 
with another agency who wouldn't comply with that. So how do we allow foster parents to engage with children and possibly keep them in their care if, I mean, how long do parents have to actually turn the situation around? You know, and nowadays they don't, they don't have like a long time. It's not like I was a foster kid and um, foster parents, we could move around with different foster parents in 10 years, 15 years. Now parents have a couple of years. Understand a lot of parents are telling me that they have a couple years to get their situation together, but they don't. That kid could be adopted by somebody in the system, you know, someone sorry, outside the system, obviously. But um, it could be adopted by a foster parent or just an adoptive parent. So, so what I would like to see happen is that we all come together. And I've said this many, many, many times. We all come together as a community. Um, as basically a protector for children and we can actually um, sit down and we can actually talk about these issues and I am calling for all foster parents who are good foster parents legislators all governmental people you know including all governors and you know deputy governors and um, I'm calling formal foster kids, foster kids, and I want to call for the used, the kids who maybe didn't make it, you know, into foster care, and let's do a movement, movement, and um, let's get to work, let's get to work on changing policies, making it better for these foster kids, and so that nobody has to go through what I did, and I want people to take accountability, and yeah, hey, didn't get it right, but now we can. And yes, you are saddened. That's what a representative told me. He emailed me back. I'm saddened by your situation. But don't patronize me. Don't like sugarcoat it and then tell me to have a nice weekend. Okay? I just think that everybody has to come together on this very serious issue. And I would like representatives to email people back really, really be on top of that and um, email them back. And it shouldn't take four years to get an answer. It shouldn't take two years to get an answer. It shouldn't take six months to get an answer. Be part of this. And so we can do this together. So how do we correct the negativity in the system? How do we um, help the public know and help um, help the media know and all the children especially that we're there for them? That we are here for them, we hear their cries, and we finally do hear their cries. And um, and we don't want them to be in pain. How do we let these children know besides telling them? And I think through our actions, having these policies, making uh, new policies that actually are more personally touched by the foster kids, understanding. If you didn't want to be raised like this, you don't want your kids to be raised like this. That why would we want to raise other kids like this? And I want everyone to feel like they have a place that is loving and caring and that we can sit there and um, and we can grow up in, in a system where we would not be abused. And I wanted that when I was a kid. So when I say we, I still feel part of that. I still feel part of that population of being a foster kid. I don't think you can ever take the foster kid out of you. That was my life. That was my calling. That was where I was. Okay? And now my calling is to help protect them and help understand them and um, help soothe their pain and help educate other people to what it feels like to be a foster kid. Okay, and I want everyone to understand that this is really a call for action for everybody to come together on the same level and understand what part they play into the foster care system. Even if you don't know anybody who was a foster kid, you grew up privileged or underprivileged, and maybe you never knew any kid that was a 
a foster kid, you can listen to the stories. You can still say, what can I do to contribute to this? And what is it that you can give that's positive? You heal a system like this. You give the kids hope. You give them a brighter future. You maybe become a mentor. You maybe take them shopping, buy them something, give them a hug if they want to hug. Some foster kids don't like to be hugged, by the way. So um, you might want to ask if it's okay to give them a hug. How do we heal alcohol? And, 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 and that's, that's a hard one sometimes. But we can try our best efforts. But sometimes you see that it hurts so bad that you, know, you, you can't get them to trust you. I know I didn't trust people. At a certain age, I was just like, okay, I'm not going to trust you. Adults were seen as the evil people. Case members were seen even more evil. And the judges sat up in their high row chair and I'm just like, okay, you know, what are you going to do? Where are you going to order me now? Where do you want me? And I just really just was tired. I was exhausted. Why did kids get overwhelmed in the foster care system? But this is our moment to change all of this. We can change all this. We can get better. We can try to keep families together. We can um, lower the um, number of kids in the foster care system because no matter how many kids take away after one child dies in the system, which is devastating, we cannot just keep taking kids. We can't just like take away a whole bunch of kids because that's going to make up for the kid they take away. That's not how it works. It is a case-by-case -case scenario. You're going to go in there, you're going to do your investigation, and you're going to see, is this child in danger? Is someone hurting this child in any other ways? So you want to make sure that this kid is safe. That's what the job of the investigator is, is to go out there, see how they are, and assess the situation, and see if they can stay in the home and get services, or do they need to come out of the home and get services? So that's exactly what we that's what they have to do. I don't do that because I don't work for child service. But if you're going to take away a kid, you make sure that kid has a bed. You make sure that kid has a home. You're going to take this child out. And there are some emergency situations. But there are situations that are just darn right, very emergency. You got to get them out. And then you're going to worry about that later. And I think that's what the problem is, is that we always look at, we'll remove the kids now because they have to be pulled out now. And we'll worry about placement later. And sometimes there aren't any placements. Sometimes there's none available. Sometimes caseworkers, and I'm going to tell you there are some good caseworkers out there. And they sit on that phone all night calling every single home. You know, can you take this kid? Can you take this kid? And this is their issues and all this. And Sometimes kids are very hard to place. We have a lot of issues going on. But who gave us those issues? So we come in the system and we're a little bit of you know, a little bit beat up and you know, we don't trust so well. But then we go to five foster homes and we end up with all these other issues. And we end up with this case file. And foster kid has seen the case file. But I've seen my case file and I saw it. And there were some things in there that was not true. There were things in there that I had been to this home this happened. Um, and basically that case file is like your reputation. So if that case file says that you're a liar, and you're a cheater, you cheat on things, and that you steal, anything that is in there, that is like your reputation and you may not accept its postures. You may be um, not going to group homes. You may not go anywhere because that case file follows you. So can you imagine you're at one home and someone you got in a fight with your foster sister and she hit you and you hit her back. You're considered to be an aggressive child. But what they don't tell you is that the other child hits you first. So it's not really fair to really... Um, to really say that in a case file, but everything's like in there, and it's things that may have not taken place the way 
you said it takes place, but it's the way the foster parents say it happened. And that's really messed up because I was beat up by my foster sister all the time. She used to break my glasses and laugh at me. But when I saw it in the case file, is that I would instigate with my foster sister. And I would stomp up the stairs and she would attack me and she would um, come in my face and I would aggressively um, go to my room. Well, what wasn't in there is that she would attack me, break my glasses, and she thought it was funny. And that wasn't in there. Or that when I was looking at them, I looked like something was going on. Indicating I had some serious issues at the time. Well, when you're upset, you're crying, and if you cry too much, like I said, you're considered to be a basket case, and you're going to be depressed, and you need help. But I don't like to be told that I have all these problems and stuff like that. A kid wants to hear all the negative stuff, and that's what happens in foster care. We don't get told anything positive. I think every home I went to, except for a couple that were good homes, I was actually treated very, um, in a manner where I was only told off. I was never told I like I love you, um, a hug, um, and there was a different treatment between me and the other kids, like they had biological kids. So that's what needs to be changed and, and how we can contribute um, and how we get treated in the foster care system. So we, we talked about like, how to promote parents to become foster parents. We promoted um, how kids can reach out for help and how uh, case workers are their biggest ally and how that case file you know, needs, to be, um, needs to be fair and it needs to also be available to the foster kid to actually view if they're old enough to view. Also, there needs to be um, as part of my bill, I actually, um, my foster care aware, foster child awareness bill, is that it's really, that's what it is. It's to bring awareness to everybody and to children who are not being treated fairly. And also to try to help these kids as they go through different stages in life. And we do not like to hear stories where girls at 14 and 15 are selling themselves on the streets. They're having their own escort businesses, their businesses, and also um, we don't like to hear stories of the runaways and and young men ended up in prison. You know, ended up in juvie, then it goes to jail, and then now they're in prison. Um, that means that we have really failed them. And no, you can't save every kid. Um, you really can't save every kid from a criminal record when they go and they stray do this because of nice you will be warned that you keep going down this road you're going to be in trouble but sometimes there's no guidance there's lots of different reasons why kids stray and they make bad decisions and I made a few bad decisions in my life too when I was a foster kid so I said I was going to run away I'm lucky I wasn't hurt you know so I was lucky that I was able to be reunited with um, you know I to a different foster home and or I would um, end up going back to the same foster home, which wasn't good. But I, I really needed um, maybe a break from the kind of aggressiveness that I was getting at the time. And, um, you know, I just want everyone to have some kind of um, awareness of the issues going on. How can you help a foster kid? How can we get laws changed? How can we go to the government and we can say, you know, go to state representatives, give them our opinions, and I want state representatives to understand what's going on. And this time I just want to forget the whole Republican view and Democrat view, you know, and really just forget that. Because right now I just feel like, I don't know how other people feel, but it just feels like there's always this kind of they don't agree, and sometimes when they do agree, then they, you know, they disagree about something else. But I think we all can agree that the foster care system is a mess, and we need to do something about it, and we need to understand each other, and that so that.
that we can help these kids, so we can help the system improve, and so we don't keep having this um, issue. I mean, because look, we are going in circles. We are just going in circles, and it seems like everyone kind of has an ideal of what to do with it. And I, I think that with different agencies, when you talk about different agencies and stuff, and and like in the state of Illinois, we do call DCFS, and you know the overall system we call Child Protection Services. Um, it's it, it's how do we get everyone on the same page? How do we get DCFS? We got a director. We got people who work in the department, obviously, and we just can't get it right. And is it one man's fault that children can't be placed? Are they taking it serious? Serious, you know that you know what's going on. And you know we talk about you know public gardens and. Um, everyone is like really angry right now, really angry, and we can all come together, we can all go to a special, you know, session, and we can give our statements, but the bottom line is, is that we have to correct the problem in the system. We have to go to the batter of the cake, and we have to basically pull out the issues and deal with those issues while protecting other kids, and it's a big job. We can do is become a mentor. A lot of us can be mentors. We can, some of us can be foster parents. We all can contribute in some way to the foster care crisis. And we can make it better. And we can, um, um, and, and I just hope what people take away from this is that, you know, I know some people have lost me. They only come out when it's like time to poll and the money for campaigns and all that stuff. And that might be true about some of them, you know. And I just want to be positive and think that, okay, maybe, maybe they do care, you know. And I, like I said many times, is I, I, I hope that this is not an opportunity for people just to get reelected or to get into the office by saying that other guys don't want that job. So put me in there. I'll do it because I've watched so many people say that it's like almost comical at this point that people keep saying that and it's really like comical but it's also sad it's like I'm gonna do a better job than the other guy and you get in there and you didn't do it oh well I couldn't do it because of this 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 so I want everyone to understand that just because you think a job looks easy Then you get in there and you can't do the job. So I, I want everyone to use um, publicity and use their media and, you know, to talk to the media and, you know, to um, to go in front of the media and, and say, and, and do it on all the issues. But I don't think that the issue of foster care should be used as a pawn by anybody to get into office or anything because right now it's a hot topic but I do think that it should be the number one priority you know except for COVID because COVID is a little bit we're still dealing with that you know with all these variants of the um the virus but we also we have to correct the problem in foster care that has to be up there at the top of the list and whoever gets in the office whoever wants to run for office they must be able to come up with it, you know, with, with with strategies to deal with the foster care system, to deal with foster kids, to deal with um, not tearing families apart if they don't have to. And I just have a lot of mixed feelings about that, you know. You know, I just don't want kids taken out of their homes if they don't need to be. And I don't want to create artificial numbers in foster care so that suffice when a child does get killed by their parents. I don't want that to be used as a reason. I want us to take away kids when we need to. And when we don't need to, we don't take them away. We can leave them in the home, work with the family. We do have to combat all these issues. And it's a big job. It's a big job so we all can come together and come up with different ideas, strategies, I'd love to hear people's ideals about what they think 
other form of confidence, you know? Let's all put our heads together. Let's all not attack other public officials. And, you know, you can give your opinion about how to fix the issue with foster care. But I don't think attacking somebody is the best way to get your point across. So, please, please be part of the movement. Be part of um, this way where we can um, express ourselves in very healthy manners and promote change for everyone. And trust me, the foster children are not the only concern here. Everyone involved in society. We want to better that, um, better it for everybody. So when these kids go out into society, when they're dropped from the state, when they age out, so they know that people care about them. And I think it is our job and our duty to actually take care of all the foster kids in the foster care system and to make it better for all of them.